Thank you, every, everybody, for, uh, for coming. And, uh, and thank you so much to, uh, to HasGeek and to Sequoia uh, and to everybody uh, who has sponsored my trip here uh, and for the kind invitation and, uh, and for the wonderful generosity uh, that everybody has shown me uh, since I've been here. Uh, my name is Mike Place. Uh, I am on the core engineering team uh, at SaltStack. Uh, I am from, uh, obviously, uh, uh, not here. I am from uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, my Twitter handle is, uh, is cached out. I'm easy to find. And uh, what I want to talk to you today is uh, what's hopefully a very gentle introduction uh, to SaltStack. Uh, I don't know how many people in here have any experience uh, with SaltStack. If you've ever heard of SaltStack, could you potentially raise your hand? You oh, that's fantastic. Used SaltStack? Oh, that's really wonderful. Uh, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, love SaltStack? <laughs> Hopefully that's the same number as the last one. So there are a couple of things that, uh, that we want to talk about today. Uh, obviously, uh, introductions. Uh, where did SaltStack come from? Why do I need it? Uh, a little bit about remote execution 101, uh, and then some basics. To be completely honest with you, uh, when I uh, proposed uh, to my bosses that I come out here, uh, they said, okay, fine, and they, uh, they turned me over to the marketing department who set me up uh, with a set of slides, and they had all of these very complex relationships on them, and they just looked like business slides, and I threw them all away. <laughs> because I don't like them, I'm an engineer, I'm not here to sell you stuff. Uh, I'm here to, uh, to talk to you uh, about actual engineering problems. Uh, so anyway, the point being that uh, after we run out of these few slides, uh, we're going to go straight to the terminal and uh, we're going to do live demos and have some fun. Uh, so uh, hopefully that'll be a good time. So SaltStack uh, right now, uh, as I've mentioned before, uh, is an open source project. Uh, it is also backed by a commercial company. Uh, we now have about 45 people uh, in, uh, in our office and uh, a number of people around the world. Uh, we are hiring, so uh, I would be very interested to, uh, to talk to, to people who are interested in that sort of thing. Um, I, always talk, um, I always start my talks with, uh, with this slide. Does anybody know who this is? Dennis Ritchie, yeah, that's right. Does anybody know who the other one is? That one's actually a little harder. It's Ken Thompson. I, I, I couldn't tell if somebody said that. Uh, if you did, well done. The reason that uh, I show the slide, this is Dennis and Ken uh, at uh, AT&T Bell Labs. Uh, this is uh, what's called the, the Unix room. Uh, and this is uh, where much early work uh, on Unix was done. The reason that, uh, that I bring this slide up is because it's important in the DevOps movement, I think, uh, to remember where we came from. Uh, because right now we're in a very, very interesting space where operations and development are coming together. Uh, and DevOps is well known for having a very broad set of tooling. But the reason that I, that I point these guys out is that there was a point in time uh, in the history of computing when we didn't necessarily have the idea of tooling at all. In fact, we had a single machine that sat in the room, and there was no difference between development and operations. Uh, if you were on the team, uh, you wrote punch cards, and then you walked across the room, and you fed them into the computer. Of course, right now, things have become considerably more complex uh, as we've moved away from, uh, from single systems and moved away from physical computing into virtualization and uh, now recently into containerization. Uh, we've seen problems that, uh, that Dennis and Ken uh, potentially never anticipated. The idea that uh, uh, even very, very small teams could be administrating uh, not just one big machine in a room, but potentially thousands, tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands. And so uh, very, very recently, we've been introduced uh, to a whole set of problems. And SaltStack is about solving those problems, uh, hopefully in, uh, in new and interesting ways. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, where Salt came from before we get into the nitty gritty. Uh, Thomas Hatch, uh, who is, uh, is my friend and my boss, uh, started SaltStack uh, in February of 2001. Uh, he got his first contributor uh, there in March 2001, and then the holy terror set in, uh, which is that uh, third spot there, uh, which is when uh, Tom uh, got an email uh, asking for a little help 
uh, and it had a very interesting domain on the end. It was, it was LinkedIn.com, and Tom said, that's odd. And uh, he went back and forth, and it turned out uh, that Tom, writing SaltStack in his basement, uh, had written something that was actually, uh, at this point, deployed in and powering large parts of LinkedIn's infrastructure, uh, which terrified him. He didn't want to come out of his, his basement at all. Uh, it still terrifies him <laughs> a little bit. Uh, but this was well before uh, we had a company in, uh, in 2012. Uh, and then, uh, of course, you know, we, we started to hire a couple of uh, uh, developers. Uh, we won some awards, which is all fine and good. Uh, and then uh, from there, the project really, really began to explode. To give you an idea of uh, the amount of, uh, or the, the level to which SaltStack is a, uh, a very active, healthy, open source uh, project, uh, on any given week, uh, SaltStack merges somewhere between 150 to 300 pull requests. Uh, we churn anywhere between 50 to 250,000 lines of code. Uh, and uh, we have about a thousand uh, unique contributors uh, that we deal with, um, and uh, which is really, really wonderful. And it, it, it just goes to show that if you make a popular or if you make a, uh, a project that solves real problems, that uh, that people will uh, <laughs> will show up. So, why do I need it? This is one of these slides delivered to me by the marketing department that uh, I don't actually really know what it means. Um, <laughs> To be, to be completely honest, I just want to get, I just want to, get to the code, right? Um, SaltStack provides predictive infrastructure orchestration and configuration management. Um, the thing that I want to say about that is that most people know about SaltStack uh, as a configuration management platform, which is all fine and good. SaltStack is, uh, does have a configuration management component. Uh, but I think it's important to, to go out and spread the word that it's not really how we view ourselves. Uh, configuration management uh, is an old solution to an even older problem. Uh, you know, Mark Burgess started work on uh, a CF Engine uh, in the early 90s, 93 uh, to be exact. Uh, so it's inaccurate to say that configuration management is something that's suddenly uh, come to us as a result of DevOps or virtualization or any of this. That's just not true. Uh, nor certainly is the need for automation a, a new need or a sudden need. But um, SaltStack instead takes a much broader approach uh, to configuration management. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about what our thinking is before we get into some demonstrations about that. As you begin to scale out uh, dramatically, uh, you begin to have a very interesting set of problems. Uh, one of those problems is as you have these uh, application stack silos that begin to emerge, uh, you need to have uh, some sort of uh, messaging bus uh, that can communicate between these silos and allow you or us uh, as uh, DevOps practi practitioners, or as I just call them, systems administrators, because that's what they are and that's what we should call them, damn it. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, we need some, some sort of uh, universal messaging bus that we can use to uh, connect uh, these disparate systems together so that we can build complex systems uh, that have stateful understanding uh, of all of its components. So um, SaltStack is built on top, uh, first and foremost, uh, on top of a high-speed messaging bus. Uh, initially, we used 0MQ. Uh, pr probably many people are familiar with them. Zero MQ is a standalone uh, messaging service. It provides pub sub and push, push pull and all of these typical messaging patterns. Uh, we, uh, for people who use SaltStack, you may be pleased to know that uh, uh, we're now moving uh, uh, in other directions in addition to Zero MQ. Uh, we now have in development a, a pure TCP uh, transport, uh, which eliminates the need for Zero MQ. Uh, anyway. On top of this, uh, this high-speed messaging uh, bus, uh, you, if you have uh, a system that you can uh, use to connect all of your disparate com components together, uh, you can begin to solve problems uh, like remote execution or configuration management. Um, what we call, uh, the, or what we hope is the future uh, of this idea uh, is something that we call uh, event-driven infrastructure. 
Uh, and so when we, you hear us talk about event-driven infrastructure, uh, what we're talking about is this idea that uh, if you have a messaging bus that can connect all of your systems together, that your entire application stack can speak to, and services that can ride upon it, such as configuration management, suddenly you can build uh, truly adaptive and reactive and reflexive systems because that stateful understanding can work up and down the stack and configuration management then becomes something that does the heavy list lifting, that allows your infrastructure uh, to react and adapt uh, to its own state or to its own failure. Um, I know that sounds kind of abstract. We'll do some demos that uh, kind of bring that back down to earth. Um, you know, SALT is extremely flexible. Uh, it becomes very, very challenging, in fact, uh, to talk about uh, because we see SALT as being uh, much more of a toolkit uh, or even uh, a distributed operating system than simply a, a configuration management platform. SALT, at its core, uh, is highly, highly pluggable. Uh, as, as we'll see uh, during some of our demonstrations. We have right now, we're shipping with SALT uh, about 23 uh, different pluggable systems uh, from remote execution uh, to, uh, to state, uh, stateful management, uh, to log handling, to, to whatever you like. Uh, and that pluggability and that modularity means that uh, in addition to just being a software package that you can download from GitHub, uh, we have tried to design it uh, so that it's something that is very, very easy to use as a development tool inside your own workflow to add additional modules to what have you. As I've mentioned now hopefully several times, uh, SALT is extremely scalable. Uh, SALT is in many, many deployments now that uh, are in the tens of thousands. Uh, and in fact, uh, there are many deployments in which uh, SALT it controls many tens of thousands uh, of minions, which is, are what we call uh, the machines being controlled, from a single master, which is the controlling machine. Uh, so our scalability in that direction is very, very good. Uh, and there are several deployments which are, which are now reaching uh, the many, many tens of thousands and probably soon into the hundreds of thousands. Uh, Security, uh, obviously all of this is, is, uh, is backed uh, by a well-tested encryption framework uh, and uh, of course remote execution uh, is where things started. Um, and the reason that, that we started there is because that's the problem that we were trying to solve initially, right? Uh, because this was, was back in 2011, uh, right at that time we had Puppet and we had Chef and we wanted to be able to do very basic things, right? Um, for example, run a single command on a thousand or on 10,000 machines. And doing stuff like that in Puppet and in Chef, being the declarative uh, configuration management languages that they are, is not as easy as it could have been. Um, and of course, many, many other people were solving that with other tools at the time Fabric and was and still is very popular. Uh, but the fact is that uh, most people uh, were still solving this with bash scripts, right? Um, and that, you know, more or less worked fine. Um, but of course, if you're using bash scripts to try and do remote execution, to try to run uh, singular commands against many hundreds or thousands of hosts, uh, it becomes slow and you have to deal uh, you know, with drift, right? What if I have different login credentials, different operating systems? Uh, what if I need to do something more complex with the output than just use T or write to a file or whatever it is? Uh, and what if I need to do this many times? So you think to yourself, oh, okay, no problem. Uh, I'll build a script, right? Um, and you do that and you think, okay, well, this is fine. This is working, you know, for the time being. Um, but again, it's really hard to scale that sort of approach, right? Uh, because you need to do great, you know, error handling and logging and authentication and all of this stuff. I don't have to explain this problem to you. Everybody here is, has dealt with it, right? Um, and then, of course, you know, you deal with even more uh, problems, right? Like, you know, uh, how do you uh, detect, uh, you know, properly detect conditionals between disparate environments, for example, um, you know, like uh, different OSs, right? Uh, or very basic orchestration problems, which are sort of hard to, to handle in a bash environment, right? I want to do uh, X on a group of servers Y before, you know, Z happens and less A, B, or C, right? Uh, that can be very hard to manage in, in strictly uh, a bash sort of SSH environment, right? Uh, and of course, keeping external data uh, er, er, secure uh, is challenging. 
so we've built the, uh, the salt stack infrastructure. This is one of those graphs that essentially means nothing. We'll look at all this stuff anyway, so forget about it. All right. Um, so salt, as I mentioned before, um, is, uh, is based on a, a master minion model. I don't think I have a, no, I don't, uh, unfortunately. Ah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Salt is based uh, on a, a, a hub-and-spoke model, right? The idea that uh, we have a central controlling machine, right, or machines, right, uh, called masters, right, and then we have multiple minions on them, okay? Um, one of the ways right now in which uh, there is a battle in the configuration management space uh, is between uh, the idea of... Um, uh, agent-based and agentless systems. You've probably heard this debate if you talked about this. Uh, what's unfortunately not well known is that SALT is both, right? Uh, SALT uh, both has an agent-based approach in which you run uh, demons on particular machines, right? Uh, you can run them on your minions, which of course gives you uh, a very, very rapid response time. Uh, the memory footprint uh, is very low. Um, and uh, it allows you to have something always running uh, in case you need to do uh, remote execution uh, or, uh, very, very quickly uh, or orchestration or what have you. Uh, but um, it also has uh, an agentless uh, mode, which we call SALT SSH, uh, which means that uh, you don't need any type of daemon uh, running on these minions. Uh, you can, in fact, uh, connect and use all the power of SALT uh, simply over SSH. We'll look at that uh, here in a couple of minutes. Um, Salt has an a open API for third-party uh, cloud and software integration. Uh, we actually have our own uh, cloud deployment uh, platform. Uh, it's called uh, Salt Cloud. Uh, and what it does is it allows you to uh, uh, connect to and provision uh, virtual mach machines on many, many different uh, commercial cloud providers or your own private cloud, uh, be it LXC or OpenStack or whatever it is. Uh, and it allows you to command and control and provision those machines, er, I'm sorry, it allows you to provision those machines, uh, and then it allows you to uh, turn things over to Salt uh, for command and control. No more slides, finally. Okay, I hate slides. Okay. Let's do some demos, okay? Um, now, uh, I'm going to run through a couple of things that uh, I just generally think are interesting. Um, if people have questions along the way, or if something isn't clear, or if you want to, uh, to see something different, please don't wait until the end. Please feel free to, to raise your hand, uh, and, uh, and we can go back and forth. Um, so, what we have here, just to, to give you a walkthrough, uh, kind of, of what we're looking at, uh, this window down here uh, in the lower left, uh, this is going to be our salt master, okay? All right. Uh, it's very easy to start. Salt, in case I haven't mentioned it before, uh, is written in Python. Uh, it's very easy to contribute to. Uh, and it runs on a very, very wide variety of machines, everything from uh, RHEL 5 to AIX to Solaris to Raspberry Pis. Uh, pretty much whatever you like, uh, we, will, uh, we will support. Uh, I'm going to bring up a single minion, and I'm going to connect it to this machine. Uh, over here is a uh, regular terminal, okay? And um, what we can do is we can illustrate that, uh, first off, that command and control, um, actually, let's do this. This is the uh, uh, SALT CLI. Uh, it's how we do remote execution. Um, and, uh, right, whoop, there's a demo fail right there. Ah, there we go. Uh, as you can see, uh, SALT is uh, quite fast. Um, now, you may be saying to yourself, well, okay, Mike, this is uh, not the uh, most elegant demo uh, because all you're doing is basically uh, sending a ping to one machine, which is local to this one, and asking uh, for it to reply. And to that, I say, fair point. Uh, but... Uh, what if we did something like this? Actually, uh, not that. Okay. Okay. Okay, actually, let's do this. Dash, dash, master. So what we're going to do here, um, okay, and 
let's be very brave. Uh, let's, uh, let's bring up oops, 100 uh, minions. Okay, we'll do that. Uh, now, I should point out that at the, right now I'm running uh, the Salt Master in open mode, which means that it blindly accepts connection requests. Of course, in a production environment, uh, authentication uh, initially is a, uh, a public key uh, to communicate uh, shared AES key, all right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, normally you uh, authenticate things that way, but for the purposes of the demo, uh, we're not going to do that. So, let's, let's ask ourselves, all right, uh, we were able to communicate with uh, a single minion in uh, uh, 0 0.19 seconds. Uh, let's look at the response time for 100 minions. Not bad, all right? Uh, 0 0.26, 0 0.27. So you can see that, uh, that SALT scales pretty well uh, in terms of uh, adding additional hosts. Uh, the, the load on the, uh, the master is quite light. Let's now actually look at some code. One of the things that I like most about SALT uh, is that uh, SALT takes a very, very open approach. Um, we, don't, we don't like magic, right? Uh, we like uh, easy to understand uh, interfaces uh, that appeal to, uh, to people who can actually go uh, and look at code, all right? So, in terms of remote execution, I mentioned this modular framework. Uh, here are the remote execution modules uh, which, which uh, SALT ships with out of the box. Uh, as you can see, there are quite a lot. Uh, there are some PYC files in there, of course, so those are duplicates, ignore those. Uh, but uh, uh, just in terms of uh, what you can do uh, with a very basic uh, SALT installation, uh, you can, um, oh, let's see, let's, uh, clean out these PYC files so that we can actually uh, see here. So let's, uh, uh, let's see what might be interesting to, uh, to look at today. Um, how about uh, any requests? Okay, I couldn't quite hear that. <laughs> I'm gonna need a microphone, I can't hear. Oh, the font size, yeah. Is that better? Oops. One more? Or is that good? A couple of more, okay. This is gonna be hard for me to see, but I'll, I'll give it my best. Okay. Um, all right, well, let's, let's just look at a very simple one here, all right? Okay, all right. Okay. Um, this is uh, manipulating, right, uh, a host file, okay? Obviously, uh, this is Python, right? Uh, but uh, what we do is we uh, map uh, remote execution directly to the uh, function uh, uh, signatures uh, in uh, uh, these, uh, these files here, right? Um, and so what that means is if uh, we want to use the, uh, the add host module, right? Obviously, we see the documentation there. It's quite straightforward. Uh, add a host uh, to an existing entry. If the entry is not in place, uh, then create it uh, with the given host, right? So, okay, that's easy enough, right? Let's do, all right, salt, right? Uh, let's do this. So we give it a target, all right? Add host, right, 27. Actually, let's do 192.168.0.100, right, foobar, right? So you can see there, right, we've got the function signature IP alias, right, that maps uh, directly here into the command line, right, the two arguments that we need, right? Oop, I keep, keep forgetting to do that. Oh, um, sorry. So the way that this works, right, uh, is that, um, it's, uh, it's module name, function name, right? So it's it should be really straightforward. Obviously over here, right, this file is called host.py, host and the function that we're using is add host, right? Yep. Okay, there we go, done. So, all right. Uh, so, you know, whether it's one machine or a thousand machines, uh, remote execution, command and control uh, becomes very, very easy. 
Uh, now, uh, the other thing that I want to point out is that um, it should be, if you know any Python at all, very, very easy to write your own uh, uh, execution module. Uh, literally, right, all you have to do, uh, let's write one called uh, rootconf.py, all right? Okay. F say hello, all right? And, uh, so. okay. Actually, let's do, just do this, okay? Okay. And we may need to restart this guy. Okay. Right. And we called this rootconf dot say hello. All right. Very simple. So if we, uh, uh, if as a part of your continuous deployment or uh, as a part of uh, uh, your day-to-day -day system administration needs, uh, instead of encapsulating all of this in bash scripts or even worse in a wiki or you know, just in your head somewhere, uh, you can actually uh, encapsulate very, very easily your commonly used uh, system administration commands uh, directly into Python uh, functions. Simple, easy, no problem. Any questions about, uh, about that? Um, so yeah, so I think what you're asking is about uh, is about targeting here. Um, okay, so um, as you can see here, uh, the syntax is uh, salt, uh, and then a target, right, and then a function to uh, run, uh, and then uh, any arguments to pass into that function. Uh, because I have all of these other minions running on the same laptop, it doesn't make any sense to have all of the minions write to the same host file, which ultimately is the same file, right? Obviously, if you were in a real infrastructure and we had, you know, a thousand minions, then yeah, it would be something that looks like this, okay? Oops, like that, right? Okay. So, um, that's, uh, that's really, really nice because I do want to talk uh, about targeting for a second, uh, and I'm actually running out of time a little bit. Uh, SALT supports uh, very complex targeting, um, and the way that it does that uh, is that uh, we have a system uh, called grains, right? Uh, grains are similar to uh, puppet facts, if you've ever used those, right? Uh, let's look at uh, what grains might look at like, right? Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, Sorry. just like that, right? So uh, you could see there, here's a bunch of information. Of course, you can write uh, your own uh, custom grains. Uh, interestingly, you can either declare custom grains uh, in a configuration file, right, i.e. to say this host is part of cluster X or part of Y, or you can write uh, Python that will then generate uh, and produce a grain. So do something like, go out and query a database and figure out which cluster I should be in, so on and so forth, right? Uh, you can see here, uh, this particular min minion has some roles. So then what I can do is something along the lines of uh, this, right? Uh, actually, let font, oh, thank you. Is that better? Okay. Uh, let's do, uh, let's target uh, everything with uh, this particular Let's, let's just do this. Oh. Everything that's running Arch Linux, right? Oops. Yeah. So, uh, root conf dot say hello. All right. Okay. Um, so we can build really, and we can do compound targeting, right? We can do you know grains. Uh, we can do lots, all sorts of things. We don't unfortunately have time right now to go through all of it. Uh, before I run out of time, though. Uh, I do want to look at, uh, at SALT's uh, state system uh, really quick and give you a quick run through of what that looks like uh, since configuration management, of course, is, is something that, uh, that many, many people end up using SALT for, okay? Um, so let's go here, all right? Uh, SALT has this concept of SLS files, uh, their state files. Uh, and we're using the same paradigm here, right? This idea that uh, we can write uh, states, i.e. Uh, in Python, right, with a particular function signature, uh, and then we can simply write uh, data structures, right, which map to those. Um, I'll give you an example. Since uh, I'm not gonna do live coding right now since I'm running out of time. Uh, 
but I'll give you an example of how that might look, all right? Um, so what we have here are, uh, are two states. At the very beginning, uh, the first line is an ID declaration uh, that's completely arbitrary. Uh, and uh, then secondly, we have uh, a state module, right, uh, and a function. This is extremely similar to, all right, I got the font this time, all right, to what we saw in execution modules, right? If we look at this, all right, and I should say that it's not required that you have to go in and look at the code. Of course, this is all you know, heavily documented on the web, so on and so forth. So please don't assume that you have to pop open the code every time you want to do something. Uh, but as you can see, this maps quite cleanly uh, into the, the function arguments here, right? Uh, the name, right? Oh, sorry, I'll make this bigger. Uh, user, minute, hour, so on and so forth, right? Of course, when we talk about stateful configuration management, right, the idea behind it uh, is that it's item potent, right? I.e., that uh, if you run the same command, unlike simply remote execution or something from the shell, if you run the same command multiple times, uh, the first time, it or every time rather, it will look for whether or not the thing that you want to be true is enforced. Uh, if it is not enforced, it will enforce it. The second time that you run it, if it's already enforced, uh, obviously it's not going to go out and rewrite a file for you every time. So let me show you uh, what that looks like. Okay, uh, as you can see, right, um, we've gone through just uh, that first block there. Um, so these state files are, are, state configurations are quite easy to write. Uh, if you don't like YAML, which uh, some people don't, obviously this is, this is YAML, um, SALT is uh, completely data agnostic. If you want to use Mako, if you want to pass this stuff in with PyDSL, um, so long as you can pass SALT a data structure of your choosing, uh, we're completely fine with it, uh, which I think is really, really nice. They're not strictly a, a DSL, they're just a data structure representation, right? So to give you an idea of how this would render, the question was uh, whether this is really a DSL or, or what we're really looking at here. Um, this is really just a, uh, a data structure representation. Uh, uh, just to give you a crash course on YAML, if you see the colon at the end, uh, you're looking at a key value pair. If you see the dash, right, you're looking at a list, so on and so forth. So this breaks down uh, quite, quite easily. If you go to like an online YAML parser, right, you can see it, you know, parse into whatever language you choose. Okay. Um, so, all right. In this case, uh, what we're doing is we're calling state.sls. Uh, state is, uh, is an execution module, which just happens to be the entry point uh, for the uh, state system, for the configuration management system. Uh, and we're calling the sls function, and we're giving it the name of uh, this state file here, which as you can see is cron demo, all right? All right, oops, and I did exactly the same thing again. All right. Dun, 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 dun. And this failed for some reason. Let me comment this out here. Whoa. It's not very pleasant. Yeah, yeah. Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, as you can see, uh, this is an example uh, of a uh, configuration management system being item potent because uh, if we look at all right, this cron tab, we can see that in fact this does already exist. If we edit it such that it does not, all right, and we run this again, obviously it's added it. If we run it again, all right, uh, it says that it is already present, right? Uh, so this is how we go out and we enforce uh, states on a system. Uh, of course, uh, SALT, like many other, other configuration management uh, engines, does have a complex uh, requisite grammar, uh, and that's just a fancy way of saying uh, we allow you in state files to create a dependency tree uh, such that you can say uh, only enforce state X if state Y happens to be true, right? Or, for example, uh, watch 
uh, what's happening in state X, right? Watch the configuration of my uh, Apache vhost configuration, and if it changes, restart Apache, so on and so forth. Uh, any questions uh, about how uh, that operates? No? Okay. I wanted to look and see what the, uh, the last thing that uh, I wanted to talk about here was. Um, what I want to do uh, at the end here is uh, do a couple of things. We talked about um, uh, this messaging bus. In SALT, uh, we call it uh, the event bus. And the nice thing with the event bus is that um, it's, it's effectively universal. You can use it uh, as a part of your continuous deployment process. Uh, you can use it uh, for monitoring. Uh, so for example, you could, uh, you could tell your uh, application uh, to signal, you know, or drop signals onto the event bus every so often. You can have SALT watch those signals and uh, when one of those signals happens to hit, uh, you could invoke the configuration management engine to make a change to your infrastructure, uh, which I think is a very, very powerful paradigm, uh, which is what I would like to close with today. Um, oh, I do actually, before I do that, want to show you SALT SSH, uh, just in terms of, well, actually, no, we really don't have time, but uh, SALT SSH, of course, does everything that we just did, right, i.e., whether it's with the state system or with remote execution, but it doesn't require a daemon running on the other side. Um, Actually, let's just let's just do it, right? Uh, salt SSH, all right? So, so right. Okay. In that case, uh, that actually opened up uh, an SSH connection uh, to the local host. No daemon required. Uh, it stood up a salt system, which is how these agentless approaches actually work. Uh, which I think is uh, is very, very interesting, right? Because in my view, memory isn't necessarily saved if you have to use it every time you want to deploy something, right? Um, to me, that, that doesn't strike me as a particularly compelling argument for agentless architecture. Uh, but it is very valuable uh, in things like uh, deployment, right, or provisioning. Uh, but uh, it may not be uh, as appropriate for the long life cycles of machines. So, um, to just jump back real quick, um, I want to conclude uh, with uh, this demonstration of the uh, uh, reactor system. Uh, what I want to do here is, um, is show you that, um, uh, so from, uh, we have these idea, uh, this idea of uh, runners. Uh, runners are master side uh, pieces of Python uh, that can go out, uh, execute arbitrary commands, uh, do things in an ordered way, um, but uh, it runs entirely master side, whereas obviously uh, the remote X stuff and the state configuration management stuff uh, runs minion side. Okay. Whoa. That's not good. Um, so, uh, what I want to do here is show you the reactor system. And what the reactor can do uh, is it can watch this event bus uh, on the master uh, for salt events or events coming from your application or what have you, uh, and then map the detection of those events uh, into your state system for configuration management or what have you. All right. Okay. I've prepared this already. All we need to do here, all right, uh, is enable what we call the reactor. Uh, give it uh, an event tag to look for. That's this, right? And a uh, state file to run, uh, which is that. Okay. All right. For purposes of demonstration, uh, we will see that uh, the state file cleverly, uh, looks like this. This will be the end of the presentation uh, because uh, when uh, this minion starts up, uh, it will fire an event saying that it has started up. Uh, the salt master, uh, the reactor, will detect that event uh, and then it will run this, uh, which will, uh, in theory, uh, shut the laptop down and end the presentation. And if it doesn't, then I'll just have to stand up here all day. So, so hopefully it works. Uh, okay. So we'll restart the salt master here to make sure that we have that configuration. Okay. And uh, here we'll, uh, in this uh, guy down here, you'll see the events flying past. 
right? And uh, here is the, uh, what should be the minion starting up, all right? And uh, thank you very much, that's it. Yeah. And I know that we only covered uh, bits and pieces of SALT. There's so much. Uh, obviously, we're going to be giving a, uh, a training class uh, on Sunday. Uh, please come by and see the many, many, many things that, uh, that we didn't get a chance to cover uh, and talk about your individual deployments and, uh, uh, and how SALT can fit into to your infrastructure. Um, it looks like I have just a couple of minutes, so I'm happy to take uh, some questions. Oh, I have 15 minutes. Oh, okay. Well, I can uh, take some questions. Uh, hi, um, I have a question on SALT. Okay. Actually, we, we have built a scheduler on top of Chef that has got pre-built cookbooks and recipes. Uh, we found some performance issues and we are trying to migrate to SALT. Uh -huh. One of the things that we found in SALT was you showed that a minion actually runs on your laptop, but when you go to an infrastructure, your minion needs to run inside a virtual machine. Sure. Uh, so in terms of Chef, we have got an ability to bootstrap that virtual machine and the minion connects to the master. Uh, to get around this problem, what is that you would suggest? The typical workflow for that in SALT is to use uh, SALT SSH uh, to connect to the machine. Uh, SALT has its own uh, bootstrap engine uh, that uh, can either download directly from GitHub or wherever you like, uh, and you can use that uh, to, uh, uh, to bootstrap the machine and have it connect to a master. You could also potentially uh, use SALT Cloud itself to deploy uh, the machine, uh, and that uh, also has the ability uh, to bootstrap it, uh, connect, actually, I mean, to bring the entire virtual machine up, uh, whether it's in a public cloud or a private cloud, uh, uh, deploy it with salt, and then connect it to a master. Does that answer your question? Yeah, we tried salt cloud as well. Salt cloud needs to run inside the virtual machine, right? Uh, salt cloud just needs to run on a Linux machine. It doesn't need a, a master running at all. But it needs to run where the minion is, right? I'm sorry? It needs to run where the minion is, right? No, it can run standalone. It doesn't need a minion running. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so uh, basically, we are using uh, salt uh -huh. uh, in our infrastructure. So, what we wanted to know is the same thing like, you know, uh, how we can uh, add dynamically hosts to the uh, master. Uh -huh. uh, without any manual intervention. Ah, right. Uh, so the question was, uh, if in a highly dynamic infrastructure, how you can add uh, minions. Um, so this reactor demo is actually uh, a very, very popular, uh, a good illustration of how that might be done, right? Uh, so the classical way that people do that is they bring their minions up, right? Uh, watch for uh, that connection, right? And then perhaps uh, invoke key acceptance or whatever your security policy is going to be, right? And then from there, once the key is accepted, you should be able to go about your business with command and control. Okay. Uh, one more question here uh, is basically when uh, we are bringing up a container, uh -huh. uh, is it dependent on the MAC ID uh, anyhow? Because uh, what we are doing is we are maintaining the same IP address and the same minion ID, uh -huh. but every time I destroy the container and bring up, uh, the key d uh, means like it doesn't match, but I have the same fingerprint. Uh, uh, and right. Yeah, so um, SALT uses public key uh, authentication uh, for the key exchange, right? Uh, if you bring up uh, a new minion, right, with the same ID, SALT is just going to generate uh, a new set of keys, right? So that's what's happening there. Um, so what's happening is you're presenting this new set of keys. The master is like, aha, you're trying to trick me. You're not who you were the last time I saw you. Uh, and so it's rejecting the session. Uh, what you want to do is either preserve the keys or manage that in some other way with uh, being aware of that, that condition. Hi. Um, hello. Here. Ah, thank you. Uh, so there may be a few odd slash corner use cases where uh, the runtime state of the application may uh, necessitate a few changes to your, um, to your infra. Uh -huh. So is there like a, a non-command line tool interface also, so where within, from my application, I could actually invoke salt and yep. make it do things to my infrastructure. Um, are you looking for a, a graphical? Uh, a 
No, no, no. Just to change the state of my infra at runtime. So there's maybe uh, mm. something in my caching layer that's changed, and now I need to, uh, you know, update the configs of a few machines to reflect that change. Right. Are, are you looking to do that automatically or automatically or from within the running app? Yeah. Right. 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 Um, so yeah, I mean that's part of the uh, the event-driven uh, uh, infrastructure um, view that we have, right? Um, so in our sense, uh, it should be very very easy to write a small bit of Python or call out to a CLI, right, uh, from whatever service is making the change, right? Uh, announce onto the Salt event event bus that the change is being made, right? the salt master in the reactor, just as in that last demo, watches for that change and then configuration management happens in response. And that configuration management can be very simple like the one we just pointed out, or it can be very complex orchestration with many dependencies and what have you. It just depends what you need. Hi, uh, Hi. thanks for the nice introduction to salt. Uh, you. Could you touch upon the distributed um, um, uh, capabilities of salt. For example, can I have a uh, you know cluster of minions uh, sharing distributed state across them? Uh, can I have uh, high availability in my minions and mm. in my master and things of that nature? Right, right, right. Uh, yeah. So right now, in terms of the distributed state, it's brokered by the master, um, and so you know you can create clusters, but there's you know messaging is still going to be brokered in that way, right? Um, now you can, you know, there are some limited uh, decision engine capabilities on the master, right, to decide who's going to get what information and you can do some filtering. We're doing some development work in that area to try and make things better. In terms of true uh, distributed peer-to-peer -peer communication, uh, we have uh, the ability to publish uh, from the minion uh, messages or or remote execution destined for other minions, right? Uh, but it's not a uh, distributed mesh in the way that like a classical distributed system might be. Does that answer your question? Yeah, do you have plans to like, extend that? We're trying, yeah, we're trying to go in that direction. Um, yeah, very much so. Right now we're engaged in a, a transport layer addition, uh, uh, adding uh, TCP transports and a couple of other custom transports. So uh, that's a direction that we'll be going. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about orchestration. I did mention. Hi. Hi. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. So right. uh, I did see orchestration somewhere in the slide. You yeah. know, uh, yeah. could you just elaborate more on how exactly orchestration has been done? Sure. Orchestration um, is one of those words that's like uh, cloud was in 2006 or 2007. Everybody's saying orchestration and nobody really knows what they, what they mean. So let me tell you what I mean when I talk about orchestration. Uh, orchestration is the idea that um, through targeted sets of, uh, we call them minions, right? Through targeted sets of minions, right? Uh, you can have a deployment process which has dependencies between those sets, right? So let me give you an example of how that might look. A typical uh, uh, orchestration workflow might say something like, okay, I'm going to deploy my application, right? Therefore, make sure Git checkout happens, right? If the Git checkout is successful, then go over here to uh, my web balance, or, you know, my load balancer cluster and take down 10%, and then, right, uh, start to, you know, do that deploy on the web tier, so on and so forth, with the ability to, you know, create those dependency chains and, of course, fail hard uh, and potentially roll back uh, at any point where that stuff fails. Great. So, of course, a workflow that you sort of set up um, based mm. on rules, it sort of go ahead and execute. Uh, can it go and uh, talk to multiple different, uh, um, I would say, systems in the data center? Because yes. it might, yeah. So, can you just give some examples on, on that? That's what I was most interested in. Uh, of multiple different systems, do mm. you mean uh, uh, like servers as well as network gear? Yes, servers, networks, yes. Yeah, I, sure. I believe, yes, that should yes. be the case, right? Uh -huh. uh, what I mean to say, let's say I've got a SAP and I've got, a, let's say, I don't know, Active Directory and I have mm. got a, a Apache server. Yep. All of them are part of my infrastructure because it's heterogeneous. So how exactly I can do orchestration here? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, very much, you know, in the way uh, that, uh, that I've already talked about, um, you know, because, you know, you can put uh, minions on all of these machines, you can control uh, networking gear like Juniper gear, right? Uh, you use salt state files to declare how that orchestration is going to operate, right? Uh, the, uh, what the workflow for your deployment process or whether, whatever it is is going to be. Uh, and then, of course, you just kick off that orchestration either, you know, in an automated fashion or, or manually. 
Uh, and later we can probably talk about the particulars of your infrastructure and get into how that might work for you. Yeah. I saw another question I thought. Yeah, there it is. Hi. How, how do you uh, test or uh, unit test those uh -huh. uh, plugins or I didn't? Yeah. How do we unit test the plugins? Yeah. yeah. Um, we, uh, we use a lot of magic mock, actually. Um, so the, the unit testing is heavily mocked. Uh, a lot of people ask about uh, how do they test uh, state files, like infrastructure testing, all right, which is a, a different question. Uh, SALT, I didn't demonstrate it, but SALT has a, a test equal true mode, right, uh, which basically will go out, um, you know, examine the state of the systems and determine whether or not it will make changes. Yeah. Did that answer the question that you had? Yeah, okay. Oh, the plugin side. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we have our own uh, our own test suite. Unfortunately, it doesn't take two minutes to run. <laughs> I was very jealous of that. Uh, but yeah, uh, there's unit testing, and of course, there's there's integration testing uh, for the plugin stuff as well. Absolutely. Yeah, the the test suite that we have um, is 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 very well done and very elaborate and and quite easy to to run on your own machine. Yeah. There's um, you'll just want to download. Uh, uh, we maintain a separate repository for our testing dependencies, so you'll just grab that, and then you'll be off to the races. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, so, how is it different from Ansible? I mean, I see mm. a lot of adm uh, advancement over Puppet yeah. in SolStack, but sure. how different is it from Ansible? And what are the parts that I have using SolStack over Ansible? Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, Ansible is a very popular uh, product. Uh, this can be a hard question for me to answer because I don't want to um, speak for the Ansible people, but I'll just speak in generalities. Uh, I think Ansible tends to be focused uh, more on the provisioning deployment side. Uh, you know, our view is that uh, machines, even in immutable infrastructure, uh, machines have life cycles, right? And you need to manage a machine beyond the point that you simply install the packages that you might need. Uh, so conceptually, our approach is more focused on the complete life cycle of the, the system versus uh, the initial deployment step. Uh, of course, the big and, and most notable difference is that Ansible talks a lot about uh, being agentless. Uh, Salt, of course, has an agent-based and an agentless mode, um, which I believe makes that point moot. Uh, they focus uh, a lot on simplicity, uh, which certainly has value. Um, however, uh, complex uh, uh, infrastructures have complex needs, uh, and that's not to dismiss uh, simplicity as a, pr a principle or a virtue, uh, but um, we would much rather uh, solve hard problems even if it makes the software uh, slightly more complex. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Okay. Yeah, uh, one is the uh, selectors. I mean, how do you actually select the infra that you are going to operate on? Okay. Uh, and how users can define that? Yeah. Uh, and the uh, other one is, uh, given you are, uh, you were talking about uh, salt in a cloud-based environment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what happens for, uh, I mean, as far as entropy is concerned of the infra over time? Uh, I mean, people are arbitrarily running, uh, you know, salt directives or event-based things are getting triggered. Uh, you see there is a disparity between uh, machines that are supposed to be the same, but they aren't. Uh -huh. uh, usually in a declarative framework, uh, the machines themselves uh, come to a state that has been well-defined. Uh -huh. uh, in an imperative framework, uh, uh -huh. you could s there is a possibility of entropy. So how do you deal with that? Right. Uh, so I think part of that's, I'll address the second part of the question first. Um, uh, and, and I think the question was, was mostly about uh, imperative declarative uh, differences, right? Um, so to fill people in a little bit uh, about this, there has very long, there's been a very long debate in the configuration management community uh, about whether a declarative approach uh, is the correct one or whether an imperative uh, approach is uh, the correct one. Uh, to give you some feedback, or to give you an idea, uh, a declarative approach uh, declares the intended state of a system, right, in a very general sense, whereas an imperative uh, approach says, do X, do Y, right? Uh, Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, I missed the last part. Ah, yes, where things are elastic, right? Um, yeah, I mean, where uh, you know, 
Salt is a configuration management, uh, has a configuration management engine, obviously, and so when things, you know, come and go, right, um, you know, there's, there certainly comes a certain point where uh, your application has to be uh, aware of, of what's happening, uh, of machines coming and going. Uh, SALT can, uh, to answer the first part of your question, uh, SALT can target uh, either via uh, machine ID, uh, via uh, grains information, right, i.e., you know, facts about the machine, right, uh, private data, which we call pillars, which uh, that machine uh, might contain. And again, you know, I always put my emphasis on SALT being a pluggable system. Uh, so if you need another targeting system, right, if you need, for example, to be able to pull from a database, right, somebody needed like Seco range once, I don't know if anybody's ever used that, uh, as a targeting system and they plugged it in. Uh, so it's, it's really whatever targeting system you need, but those are the ones we ship with SALT right now. Hello. Hi. Yeah, uh, want you to talk about a particular scenario. Uh, say I want to manage a lot of minions, and these minions are installed on systems which are mobile in nature. Ah. Okay, and these systems are connected to the master through a very inconsistent internet connection, you know, right. uh, which is very flaky, very slow. Mm -hmm. Such a scenario, is SALT a good choice? Mm. Uh, it, it, it depends on uh, the extent to which you're going to want to command and control these machines. Uh, SALT, uh, ZeroMQ is TCP based, right? Which is, which it kind of should be enough set, right? TCP is not necessarily uh, designed for extremely long running session times uh, and for really, really quick uh, session reestablishment. Uh, what I would do in the scenario that you're describing uh, is use one of our alternative transports. Uh, we have written our own network transport called RATE. It's the Reliable Asynchronous Event-Based Transport. Uh, it's UDP-based, and it's much more resilient in the sorts of situations that you describe. And that's like production grade ready to be used or it's something like that? Yes, it's being used in production uh, at uh, infrastructures in the tens of thousands of nodes right now. Okay, cool. Hey, uh, this is a question. Okay. It's, it's more about like, can you provide a brief info about what's the Windows support for SALT? Because that's some of something kind of a pain point mm -hmm. when you com compare different other tools in the same domain. Yeah. Um, so SALT does have Windows support. Uh, we actually just finished uh, uh, master support for the Windows, which not a lot of people know. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, Windows is a first class citizen uh, for SALT. Uh, we actually just hired uh, about three months ago now a Windows development team. Uh, so we now have full-time uh, Windows developers. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, there, are, there has been a little bit of a backlog for Windows bugs, uh, but those are rapidly, rapidly going away. So the improvement that you've seen on the wi you'll see on the Windows side in this most recent release uh, is probably miles ahead of what you've seen in previous releases. Thank you, Mike. Please take the rest of your questions offline. We're out of time. Uh, so Mike's workshop is only going to have 12 participants, so please register quickly at the registration desk to get uh, into the workshop. Uh, thank you, Mike, thank and you. thank you, Sequoia, for getting him here.